Hey there, and welcome to this course on Englishes around the world. In this series of videos, I want to talk about different varieties of English that are spoken all around the globe. I want to talk about their structural features and their social characteristics. And of course, I want to explain how it is that English has become a global language that is spoken pretty much everywhere on this planet. What I have to say uh, will be based on a book by Edgar Schneider. It has the title English Around the World. Um, now, if you want to follow these videos, you don't technically need to read the book. However, there are several advantages. Yeah? So for one thing, you'll be able to look up all the references of the studies that I'll be discussing in this book. And second, you'll be able to go into a lot more detail than what I can discuss in these videos. So if I were you, you know, do yourself a favor, get a copy of the book and read along as we go through the individual topics. Right. As for myself, I have five goals for this course. At the end of it, when you will have watched all the videos, you'll be able to do five things. Uh, first of all, you'll be able to identify different world Englishes. Maybe you already know how to do that. Maybe you already know how to, let's say, differentiate between American English and British English and Australian English. But in this course, we'll try and fine tune your ear so that you can hear, for instance, the difference between an Australian speaker and a New Zealand speaker. Or you can hear uh, whether someone is a speaker of Nigerian English or Filipino English. Okay, so we'll be looking at the relevant features, the relevant pronunciations, and your ear will be a lot sharper once you finish this series. Second, we'll discuss how English has spread around the world. And when I say English has spread around the world, that makes it sound as if English as a language has somehow gotten on its way and has moved into every last corner of this world. Technically speaking, that is not really what happened, right? So the history of English as a global language is essentially a history of colonialism, and that is a problematic aspect that we'll have to talk about in detail. Third, uh, I want you to be able to use online resources for the study of world Englishes. There are a number of highly useful resources out there. For example, the Electronic World Atlas of Varieties of English. And with those resources, you can look up all sorts of features. You can find out which varieties are similar to one another or very different from one another. And uh, that is something that you should absolutely be familiar with. So we'll be checking that out. Fourth, um, you'll be able to group world Englishes into different categories according to different principles and different ideas. Okay, so of course, there are traditional varieties of English like British English and American English. But what about varieties that are spoken in areas that are inherently bilingual? Okay, where several languages coexist and are used for different purposes. Um, we'll talk about different ways of categorizing Englishes and we'll try to make sense of these categorizations. Um, that actually relates to the fifth point where we will try to understand and criticize different theoretical models of how new Englishes develop. Okay, here we're getting into linguistic theory. Okay, we're not just describing the sounds and structures of different varieties of English, but we're actually trying to understand what happens when new varieties of English develop. Okay, I hope you join me in this adventure and I'd like us to start with an example. Okay, you're about to hear a recording of a speaker and I want you to focus on the following three questions. So get out a piece of paper and a pen. The questions are as follows. Where does the speaker come from? Can you place the speaker anywhere on a world map? Second, how educated do you think the speaker is? And third, what might be the context of this speech? You ready? Okay, so let's go. No, knowledge is not come from vacuum. You have to read, you have to meet with people, you have to have discussion, and in fact, you have to appreciate the differences between your opinion and other opinion. Then, 
it start it create a thinking it create a thinking skill it create it create something that will generate the the new things some people may be looking at how coconut falls from the tree and when we ask them why coconut fall from a tree maybe he said because it is old enough and ripe enough and it's fall but if you ask a physicist why falls why coconut fall from a tree he will say it is because due to gravity so different person have different perception of falling object therefore having a knowledge about falling object will create you some ideas how we can change we can transform energy from one form to another form basically knowledge is generator so if we want to build our nation if we want to build ourselves if we want to improve ourselves there is no other thing other than knowledge we have to we have to, we have to be very very concerned about development the knowledge let's get back to our three questions first of all where does the speaker come from i think it's easy to hear that this is not a native speaker of british english or american english he has to come from somewhere else but where exactly we'll get to that in just a minute then how educated is the speaker well I think it's apparent that this is a highly educated speaker who is talking about a topic that is abstract and complex. Yeah? The speaker develops an argument that is sophisticated and coherent and that has examples and illustrations. So this is clearly not an everyday situation, but something more formal. Yeah? The context of the speech might be an academic debate or a public discussion or something of that sort. And in that kind of situation, you don't use your everyday language, but something more elaborate. So even though the speaker clearly does not use the standard grammar and standard pronunciation of, let's say, British English, uh, the speaker clearly is using his elaborate version of their variety. So I want us to continue with this question here, namely, how is the speech of this speaker different from standard American English or standard British English with regard to pronunciation and grammar? So I would like you to go back in this video and listen to the speech once more and on a piece of paper, identify three features with regard to pronunciation and three features with regard to grammar where the speaker differs from what you would have learned as the standard grammar of American English or the standard grammar of British English. All right. If you want to do that now, I will continue in three, two, one. Here we go. So let's start with the differences with regard to pronunciation. One characteristic of the speaker is that he uses monophthongs in certain places where American English or British English would use diphthongs. So let's take, for example, the word say. Yeah, when I pronounce the word say, um, it comes out with a diphthong, uh, which is the second transcription that you see here. Let me play what the speaker is actually producing and we'll compare that. I'll play it again. Okay, so what the speaker produces sounds more like se rather than se. So that's a monophthong, just one vowel instead of two vowels in a row. The same phenomenon can be seen in the word basically. Yeah. So when I pronounce it, it's with the same diphthong, basically, and the speaker says something else. Let me play it to you. Basically, knowledge is generated. I'll play it once more. Basically, knowledge is generator. Okay, so that sounds more like basically, yeah, so the vowel is short and it is a monophthong a rather than a diphthong a. So that's one difference with regard to pronunciation. 
Another difference with regard to pronunciation is the stopping of voiceless interdental fricatives. Voiceless interdental fricatives are those sounds that uh, give a lot of trouble to second language learners of English. So I'm talking about the TH in words like thinking. Yeah. Let's see what the speaker is actually saying. Okay, do you hear that? Uh, he pronounces it as thinking rather than thinking. Yeah, small difference, but one that is very typical of this variety and in fact many others. Here's a third difference with regard to pronunciation, and that would be the phenomenon of final consonant cluster reduction. When you have several consonants at the end of a word and only one of those consonants is actually realized. So um, <clears throat> one example that I have on the slide here is the uh, word ask. Yeah, So ask has an S and a K in a sequence and this is realized without the final k yeah and in the word physicist we have an s and a t and of that only the s is realized as well let's listen to the speaker but if you ask a physicist so if you ask a physicist yeah so in both cases the final consonant is missing from the consonant cluster let me come to some grammatical differences one difference that I'm sure you've noticed is that our speaker uses articles in a way that differs from standard American English or standard British English. For example, when he says come from vacuum, that would correspond to standard British English come from a vacuum with an indefinite determiner a. Yeah? The same phenomenon is visible in how coconut falls, which would be rendered as how a coconut falls in standard British English or standard American English. It's not always the case that the speaker has articles that are quote unquote missing. Yeah? The speaker also uses articles where they would not appear in, let's say, standard American English. So he says, having a knowledge of this would come out in American English as having knowledge of without the indefinite determiner. Now, the presence or absence of determiners is a big variable that distinguishes between different varieties of English. So that is something that we'll talk about quite a lot. Uh, another distinction that we'll talk about in detail is the distinction between singular and plural. You notice perhaps that our speaker said other opinion, where you might have said other opinions with a plural S. Yeah? The absence of inflections is another typical characteristic of many non-native varieties of English. Then there are differences with regard to prepositions. Our speaker says, because due to gravity. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have said because of gravity instead of because due to gravity. But clearly, this is something that is conventional in this variety of English. And then, of course, verb endings are another important variable that we need to take into consideration. So our speaker says, then it start. Yeah? without the third person singular s, then it starts. Right, um, so there are all these differences with regard to pronunciation and with regard to grammar. And I'm sure that when you went to school, you actually produced some of these structures. Yeah? Maybe you had a missing ending or your prepositions were not quite right and your teacher corrected you. Yeah? And so you might remember that and look at what our speaker does and think, well, this is clearly wrong English. Well, the answer would be no. This is, in fact, Malaysian English, which is a conventionalized variety of English. Malaysian English is used as a second language in Malaysia. It's taught at school from grades 1 to 12. It's the language of business and higher education. It is used in radio stations. It has newspapers. It is uh, British English influenced. Uh, we know that because it's a non-rotic variety. And by all means, it is a conventionalized variety of English. 
Um, this brings me to the topic of world Englishes in general. So English, as you well know, is spoken around the world. And the point that I wanted to make with this initial example is that there is no single correct way of speaking English. There are different varieties of English and each variety has its own systematic characteristics. So Malaysian English in the way that we've heard it in the example differs systematically from British English, not randomly. It's not that every speaker of Malaysian English has their own way of uh, twisting the rules of standard British English. It's rather that there's a conventionalized system of rules that all speakers of Malaysian English share. <clears throat> now, coming back to the goals of this course, I want to go through each of these one by one and exemplify them with a little more material, starting with goal number one, how to identify different world Englishes. Let's go through some examples and let's try to pinpoint where the speakers are coming from. So here we have speaker number one. Let's take a listen. Now for this recipe, you're going to need a few things. You need a little bit of olive oil. We've got some molasses, we've got dry mustard, and here I have cooked up some bacon. I've got some chopped onions, and here I've got some jalapenos. Here I've got some rub. You're going to need a little bit of beer for both the recipe and the pit master. And here I've got two one-pound cans of regular baked beans. All right, you're familiar with that? Get yourself good quality baked bean for this recipe. Okay, I'm guessing that was not so difficult. Let's move on to mystery speaker number two. Aha! Uh -huh. Immediately we notice a darker color compared to the previous bottling of the 12 year old. And uh, it does suggest sherry, but how much is caramel is anybody's guess. Because the BAM sticks, these distillers, they just don't tell you on the label. And considering what they charge for it, they should. <laughs> okay, I think you managed to pinpoint that one too. Let's move on to sample number three. And if you don't sit up, this house will be too small to contain the both of us, okay? <gasps> yeah, me too. I'm sick and tired of you and this marriage. Just in case you haven't noticed. What did you just say, woman? You heard me. I'm sick of this marriage. You need to be careful. Oh, yes. Oh, just walk out. In fact, you don't even have anything to offer me anymore. Violet! Did you just say you're tired of this marriage? Yes. There was no water in my mouth when I said it. You need to be careful. Okay. Mystery speaker number four. In the years in which I've served as Prime Minister, predominantly, I have faced a minority parliament and I've also faced internal division within my political party. It has not been an easy environment to work in. But I am pleased that in this environment, which wasn't easy, I have prevailed to ensure that this country is made stronger and smarter and fairer for the future. Okay. Number five. The palpitation might increase. Tension might get built up. Do nothing, just observe it. Just accept the fact that there is anger which has arisen in my mind at this moment and look there is heat in my body or the palpitation has increased or there is tension, whatever it is. You just observe that and accept the fact that my mind is at present full of this particular negativity. And our final speaker, number six. I was sitting with my girls and Joy said, Dang! I wish he'd get off my back. My daddy, he calls me all the time. Lucky for you, he calls it all, said Jasmine. I haven't heard from my dad in years. At this moment, I knew that girls needed a way to connect with their fathers. Did you manage to place all six on the map? If not, don't worry, you can pause the video, listen to the examples again, and try to guess where they're coming from. I'm going to give you the map right now. So here they are. Speaker number one was from the USA. That was probably not too difficult to figure out. Speaker number two was Scottish English. Speaker three, uh, those two were speaking Nigerian English. 
Speaker number four, that was Australian English, five, Indian English, and speaker number six was African American Vernacular English. We'll talk about all of these varieties in more detail in this series of videos. Right, for now, let's move on to goal number two, and let's talk about how English spread around the world. In this video series, I'm going to distinguish between four different diasporas. A diaspora, that's a term for the movement, migration, or scattering of a people away from an ancestral or traditional homeland. The term is used in the Handbook of World Englishes, and the first of these four diasporas would describe the movement away from the birthplace of Old English, right? So that would be the movement into Wales, Ireland, and Scotland, where already new varieties of English formed. The second diaspora describes the beginning of the colonial history of Britain um, into what is nowadays the United States and Australia. The third diaspora is a consequence of the colonial history of Britain and other powers in uh, the Caribbean, in West Africa, South Africa, in India, and in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. The fourth diaspora is no longer tied to any specific place in particular, but rather it concerns the role of English as a global language everywhere on this planet. So this concerns all places in which English is spoken as a language of education or as a second language or as a language that has a role to play in the media or in popular culture. Right, with that in mind, let's go on to goal number three, using online resources on World Englishes. There's one resource that I'd like to draw your attention to, namely the Electronic World Atlas of Varieties of English. This is a fantastic resource that allows you to explore how Englishes are used and spoken around the world. So, um, the eWave distinguishes between five different types of world Englishes, namely traditional L1 varieties, which would include the traditional dialects that are spoken, let's say, in Britain. Uh, it also includes so-called high-contact L1 varieties. African-American vernacular English would be one of those. We also have Maltese English uh, that you see here. Um, then there are indigenized L2 varieties, uh, Malaysian English that we discussed a minute ago will be one example of that. And then there are English-based pigeons and creoles. So for example, there's Cameroonian pigeon and there is Jamaican creole. Uh, we'll talk a lot about pigeons and creoles later in this course. Right, um, now what are the features that we can explore on the basis of the e-wave? Uh, I wanted to focus just on one feature briefly here, namely negation and how it's realized around the world. Negation can be accomplished in lots of different ways. Um, I've just listed a couple of interesting features on this slide. There is what is called negative concord, where you have negation marked in several places in the same utterance. So in a sentence like, he won't do nobody no harm, we have negation in won't, we have nobody, and we have no in no harm. So negation is actually marked three times in that sentence. Uh, there is an existential negator um, that has the shape of no more or no mo, and we'll see examples of that and where it is used. There is ain't as the negated form of have, as in you ain't seen nothing yet. There is invariant don't for all persons, uh, including the third person singular where you've learned to use doesn't instead of don't, yeah. Um, but many varieties actually have don't, so they would use uh, he don't go there instead of he doesn't go there. Uh, there's no as a so-called pre-verbal negator, which you all know from the song No Woman No Cry. Yeah, it maybe means something different than what you think it means, but we'll talk about that. And then in the traditional British dialect area, there is the so-called was, weren't split, where speakers say, the boys was interested, but Mary weren't. Now, you and I, if you are a speaker of standard British English or standard American English, you would use was um, for singular subjects and were or weren't for plural subjects. But there are dialects that make this split according to 
positive and negative statements. So was for positive statements and weren't for negative statements. I just cut up the uh, grammatical cake a little differently than we are. Okay, so let's see some examples of that. Uh, he won't do nobody no harm, negative concord. Negative concord is used in all varieties that you see on this slide that are marked up in red. Those have a highly frequent use of negative concord. And you see that this is not just an isolated feature, this is something that happens in practically all pigeons and creoles and in a good amount of traditional dialects as well. Negative concord is famous for the fact that you're not supposed to do it, okay? There are many prescriptivists grammar sheriffs who will call you out if you use negative concord and I brought a little example here. So we have a sheriff who says, sorry stranger, but I'm the only sheriff in this here town. And the grammar sheriff replies, I know, I'm just the grammar sheriff. And the real sheriff replies, that don't seem like no kind of sheriff to me, upon which uh, the grammar sheriff does what needs to be done. Just to make you aware, negative concord can be dangerous stuff. Right. Uh, here we have the negative existential no more, yeah, no more. Uh, in Hawaiian Creole, you can say things like no more nothing inside there, yeah. So there is nothing inside there. You ain't seen nothing yet. Well, that is a feature of many varieties, including African American vernacular English. Um, he don't go there. Well, that would be a feature of Malaysian English, which we've seen a couple of minutes before. This brings us to the pre-verbal negator no in no woman, no cry. And of course, you've seen this coming. This is used in Jamaican Creole. It means woman don't cry. It's an imperative. It's not the conditional if there's no woman, then you don't cry. That is something that I used to think when I was growing up. But of course, well, there are some things that you can learn from a varieties of English class, and this will be one example of that. Right, uh, here we have the boys was interested, but Mary weren't. The was weren't split is something that we have, for example, in East Anglian English, one of the traditional uh, L1 varieties of English that is represented in the E-Wave Atlas. Let's move on to goal number five the ways in which different kinds of English can be distinguished. Now, um, there's a three-way distinction uh, between English as a native language, English as a second language, and English as a foreign language, which is very often made. Yeah? So English as a native language would be abbreviated to ENL, and that would concern the uh, varieties of English that are spoken as a native variety of the majority of a population. So this would capture UK English, USA English, Australian, New Zealand, and Canadian English. Uh, it contrasts with ESL and EFL, so English as a second language and English as a foreign language. Now, what's the difference between those two? Well, ESL varieties are strongly rooted in their respective societies for political and historical reasons. Uh, they are routinely used by the majority of the population in sectors such as education, business, or media. And so ESL varieties are what we have in post-colonial societies such as India or Nigeria or Malaysia. The example that we had earlier of Malaysian English, that is a typical ESL variety. EFL varieties are Englishes that are taught as foreign languages. <clears throat> Those are varieties that are widely taught, widely acquired for practical purposes, but uh, they don't have social contexts in which they are dominant or exclusive. So English in Switzerland is a language that is widely used, for example, in the academic context, but it is by no means dominant in that context. Yeah, We use it, but it's not that we cannot get by without using it. Okay. Um, another way of dividing Englishes into categories is what you see in the E-Wave Atlas, where uh, the creators distinguish between traditional L1 varieties, so those would correspond to ENL varieties. Then we have high contact L1 varieties, yeah, so AV and Maltese English. Those would also be English 
as a native language varieties, ENL varieties. Then we have indigenized L2 varieties. Those would correspond to the ESL varieties in the first categorization scheme. Um, and then we have um, pigeons and creoles, uh, which don't really map onto the EFL category that I've talked about earlier. Right. So there are different ways of categorizing Englishes, and we'll go over a couple of them to see how they line up and how they disagree with one another. I'm moving on to the fifth and final goal for this course, namely different models of world Englishes and how they develop. Um, there are two models that we'll recognize rather often. One of them is Catru's three circle model, which has an inner circle, an outer circle, and an expanding circle. Catru's inner circle uh, captures varieties such as American English and British English um, that correspond to Englishes as a native language. Outer circle varieties are the ESL varieties, so Indian English, Singapore English, and so on and so forth. And then the expanding circle varieties correspond rather well to EFL varieties, so English in China, English in Russia, English in Switzerland. We'll talk more about this. Another model that we will talk about very often is Schneider's dynamic model. Well, we're using his textbook, so it comes as no surprise that the dynamic model plays a rather important role. Um, Schneider tries to work out how Englishes in post-colonial contexts develop, and so the dynamic in the dynamic model uh, relates to the fact that we have a development that proceeds through time. So there are five different stages that Schneider distinguishes. One is the foundation stage. So English is brought into a new place by the colonizers and a local minority is made bilingual. Yeah? Then in the second stage, we have what is called exonormative stabilization. So English is established as a language of administration and a local elite is made bilingual so that they can be trained, so to speak, to subdue the rest of the population. Uh, then there is nativization, and this often goes along with the strive for political independence. Um, interestingly, many former colonies actually um, hold on to English as a way of having a cultural association and a cultural heritage. This may seem paradoxical, but we'll talk about why this happens. And a common consequence is that populations in these former colonies are largely bilingual. Once we move on to stage number four, we are moving into what Schneider calls endonormative stabilization. So in exonormative stabilization, English is established as a norm that is imposed from the outside. Yeah? So there's a clear orientation towards a norm that is outside of the place itself. Yeah? So either American English or British English. But in endonormative stabilization, a local norm of English emerges. So for example, Malaysian English would be the result of endonormative stabilization. A local norm has established itself and is subsequently codified in dictionaries and grammars and learners' materials and so on and so forth. Once endonormative stabilization has taken place, we're moving into stage five, which is the stage of differentiation. So within a new variety of English, new varieties, new dialects emerge within that local norm. So there are by now different ways of speaking Malaysian English. Malaysian English has diversified into a variety with several dialects that it comprises. Right. Um, so these are the five goals of this course. I hope that you'll come along for the ride. It will be an exciting one. And I hope to see you in the next video of this series. Until then, have a good time and bye-bye.